practice if the technologies uh, were devised for one purpose and are being repurposed for another. They may not be neutral as regards technologies to perform a particular function. And so technological neutrality, net neutrality, all these kinds of things um, may inject some bias into this. Now, it's not necessarily the case that we can escape this, but we need to be aware of it. And standardization as an activity can help to do that. And the other thing is that if the parties who are driving the technologies and the business development and so on are concerned with their specific interests, it's important that the development of the internet and ICTs, uh, both nationally and internationally, uh, don't trample on things that are not mediated through markets or not obviously expressed in technical terms, uh, which I've shortcut there as human rights imperative, but the, um, the briefing talks about in more detail. From a technological point of view, the stability and the function of the internet, which was a driving force at the beginning, needs always to be retained. And it's particularly important as the standards for interoperability open up the internet so all kinds of different devices, different data, different organizations and so on have to connect to each other. And it's not just that they can connect to each other, it's important that the way they do it doesn't bring down the internet as we saw with, for example, some kinds of algorithmic financial trade. Um, we also have to be aware of network effects that if there is this kind of tipping tendency where more people using a given standard makes that standard more attractive, it can lead to a rate of innovation and progress, which is either too fast or too slow compared to what would be optimal. And we also have to recognize that the standards are not independent of each other, but form these linked uh, sort of ecosystems. From a practical point of view, there are various sets of principles, architectural principles or values, which have emerged. I just mentioned three of them here, but again, the brief goes into more detail. Um, but they also lead to certain kinds of, let's say, social artifacts. For example, the concept of permissionless innovation. We want the standards to preserve certain things like interoperability, but not to the point of locking down what people are able to do. And it may be necessary to create sort of sandboxes to experiment with things that violate the standard in case as a result of looking at that, we see that the standard could be improved, replaced, or possibly done away with. And we also need to look at the different types of standards uh, development organizations and the ecology that connects them. Because when you study these things, <coughs> you see that their missions change and that the people who are involved move from one to another uh, as the challenges change. Okay, and then we come on to the next slide, <coughs> which is the one I was supposed to talk about, which is the role of governments and non-government entities in relation to standardization. As I see it, standards are a kind of alternative to regulation. And so governments have a role to play, which is co-regulatory, to back or help to enforce standards when they come into being and to facilitate the process of developing them. Um, but we do have to recognize, and it, it's clear in the EU-US context that this is important, that standards which reflect the technological development or market specifics of one economic domain will be favored by the government of that domain. And so the EU, for example, had said at a certain point that EU-funded research projects should aim at standardization which is early and EU-specific as much as possible. And we saw in certain other technological domains like HDTV that an attempt to develop the best standard from the point of view of each of the major shareholders leads to basically no progress at all on the global development of the technology. So we need to recognize that governments are benevolent, but it's a qualified benevolence. Some member states are very active in standardization, either by creating national bodies, by linking their research programs to standards activities, uh, overtly directing them to inform standards creation or to participate in standardization. And it's sometimes the case the government uh, or officials participate in international uh, standards development organizations. And they may also complement the 
coverage of standardization to ensure that things that are of public interest um, and issues that are of policy significance get taken into account when standards are developed. In the EU, one of the main drivers is the harmonization of the digital single market through the program of research and innovation, but also through demand side instruments like procurement. The point here on procurement is that in the procurement directives, um, when you put the, make the specification for what you're allowed to buy, it is permissible when you specify the requirement to include compliance with particular standards or better still to say comply with this standard or demonstrate equivalent performance. So that protects innovation around the standard. Now, in this case, the standards that are endorsed are either what are called EU standards and some of those developed by the major standardization bodies get endorsed at EU level uh, and taken up. Or they may be member state standards, which when a member state uh, does a, a large scale procurement, it may ask for um, compliance with its own standards. The point is that's allowed within the law. And that creates a market drive to take up these standards. There are also certain regulations that mandate or encourage the use of what are called open standards. There is a specific, and you'll hear more about that later, ICT standardization plan. <coughs> and there are also various other joint initiatives about which we can talk as interesting things. And the objectives that the EU uh, endorses are pretty close to those that have been endorsed by the WTO. Um, so there is at least a consistency or standardization of objectives around standards. From the US side, on the development side of things, there is, of course, NIST, which is a standards body uh, by design and is very closely wired into a lot of government activity. And there are also encouragement from things like OMB Circular A119, which again are described in the, um, in the brief. There's a, a certain amount of enforcement of standards or standards compliance by the Department of Justice, Federal Communications Committee, uh, Commission, and the FTC, uh, mild employers. That's particularly important for, let's call them functional standards like privacy. And in areas like the Privacy Shield, uh, they only work, which is a matter of mutual recognition, where US entities say that they're complying with EU standards. Uh, there has to be some degree of monitoring and enforcement. And then there are the demand side instruments which particularly in the US come through Department of Defense uh, procurement. And the objectives are that these things should be timely, relevant, cost effective, and so on. Okay, if we go to the final slide of my section, please. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of hot areas or areas that seem to me active areas where the EU US dimension of standardization was particularly important. Uh, privacy is obviously an important one, both because of the privacy shield, but also because of the rolling out of the general data protection regulation, which sets new standards and addresses quite specifically what it means to comply with them on a national and an international basis. Uh, trade agreements are another important thing because one of the principal non-tariff barriers to trade between economies is whether or not the entity that wishes to sell into your market complies with the standards that you impose on domestic producers or sellers within your market. And so these standards do have a kind of mm, trade aspect. Um, also, to the extent that uh, Picasso has been looking at things like joint research, and I won't preempt what the technical groups will say later, uh, standards arrangements, both in terms of what standards get used like in particular the ISO 9000 ones um, about research conduct, but also in terms of how the results of the research are taken forward into standards, whether and in what form. Uh, that's a hot area to the extent that we're doing international research. And finally, cross-border procurement for much the same reason as with trade agreements, except that you have greater leverage where the government can involved. Okay. That's what I wanted to say, and some provocations, hopefully, towards a, uh, a wider discussion. Um, and you're more than welcome to ask specific questions 
or as Martin has said in chat, we'll keep the wider discussion till after all the presentations. Thanks. Very much. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent introduction, and, and I take it you all have seen the document. Uh, uh, as Jonathan said, uh, let's move on to the next speaker. I would love Olaf Koopman to share from his perspective. He's been involved in standardization efforts for many years in his life, and uh, from that, and his, in his current role, he still have a high interest for that. Uh, Olaf, floor is yours, and please. Uh, Put your questions in the chat for now, for, and either answer it now or later for clarification uh, after the session. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Olaf Kolkman. Um, let's just start the next slide. Um, um, yeah, I, I have been involved in the ITF, but I want to make sure that that it is clear that I'm not speaking on behalf of the ITF in this in this talk. There are three things that I wanted to talk about, and it's a bit of a challenge after such a comprehensive overview of the field uh, by Jonathan, uh, which um, I actually learned from a lot. Um, uh, but three things that I would like to touch upon. Uh, first, the rolling plan, which uh, I think provides a somewhat unique uh, European perspective on, on standardization. Um, uh, some of the background around that. Um, talk about horizontals and verticals. I think also something that um, Jonathan somewhat um, touched upon. And then finally, uh, something around uh, the, the, the way that the nature of standardization is changing, and, and perhaps with an example or two. So, next slide. Um, when, when I was approached by Martin and, and asked if I wanted to say a few words, I, I, I immediately had to think about the multi-stakeholder platform for ICT standardization. Um, that is a, a platform that was uh, 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 set up by the two um, directorates that are now called uh, Growth and Connect in uh, about the 2011-2012 the time frame. Um, with the, with, the, with the idea to, to make sure that there is a shared awareness of developments and that there is a place where um, standard bodies, uh, the formal as well as the informal one, and I'll get to that in a second, and, and sort of the market par parties and, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and, and the nation states uh, uh, can talk among each other about what the standardization landscape looks like. The MSP has two tasks. One is the development and the maintenance of the rolling plan on ICT standardization. And the other one is one that uh, Jonathan just uh, uh, touched upon, is the identification of standards that can be used in procurement. Um, it used to be the case that um, uh, if a, uh, a, a, a nation state would procure for um, uh, for goods, it could only refer to formal standards. Those are standards by the uh, national standards bodies or the formal um, uh, European standard bodies, ETSI, SEN, SENELAC, um, uh, and the international standards bodies like ISO and the IT, uh, ITU. Um, groups like IEEE, IETF, uh, W3C were could not refer to the specifications of those groups um, um, uh, in a formal way. Not that that was not being done, but it, but it was formally not allowed. So uh, one of the things that the MSP does is actually look at specifications that are of national interest um, and are submitted by the national bodies to the, to the MSP and, and um, looks at a certain set of uh, criteria much in line with the WTO criteria on the development and the maintenance of the specific specifications and then sort of whitelists them for procurement. So that's one goal. Sorry, that took a little bit longer uh, than I wanted, but the other goal is the rolling plan. And the rolling plan is trying to align um, the European 
policy objectives and map them to what is happening sort of in the standards arena. Next slide. If you look at the rolling plan uh, content, and I believe I had a, a link in the previous slide, then um, uh, what it shows is um, basically a set of uh, policy objectives. This is the structure of each of the of the of the um, of the um, uh, of the ch of the of the chapters in the in 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 the in in the book in the in the rolling plan. Uh, there there are four sections: key enablers and sec uh, security, societal challenges, innovation for the digital single market, and sustainable growth. And within those uh, four quadrants, there are a number of uh, of uh, appointed uh, attention um, uh, groups, so to speak for which the policy objectives are described, the legislation and policy documents are referred to, proposed new actions on standardizations in the formal uh, context are referred to, and there's an overview of what is happening in the field. Um, next slide. Um, just to give an example, or, or just a next slide, just to give you an overview of the specific uh, 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 points of attention, the, the, the policy areas, in which uh, this work has been done. Uh, you see key enablers in security, and this is a, an abstract of the 2017 rolling plan. The 2018 rolling plan is currently being written. Um, 5G, um, one of the areas of uh, attention, cloud computing, public sector information. I'm not going to read these up. You can, you can read them for yourself. But so these are the sort of policy directives, and then uh, um, uh, the, the, the group has div, uh, dived into um, um, uh, the specific needs. So if you look, for instance, at 5G, um, uh, there is a, a, a policy objective around uh, the, the global, uh, about the digital single market. Um, the, the, this around 5G, the, the, the document specifically refers to um, seeking global uh, standards. Um, it, it seems to have not that big a focus on, um, on, on the European standards. Um, the actions there are, are really looking at global, go, global industry standards. There's a realization that 5G is going to be something that is globally needed. And that competitive benefit, I think, um, um, uh, uh, is there if you pro if you produce for the for the for the for the market. Um, obviously, there is a, a lot of standardization activity uh, in this in this in this world. Uh, the document um, refers to work in Etsy, in IEEE, and the ITU. Um, that's probably basically because uh, a lot of the work currently is uh, is is being do, uh, done with respect to the to the to the um, uh, to the connectivity layers, uh, enhanced radio, uh, those type of things, um, and there's not that much of a um, spur of activity in other standards bodies. I think that is on the horizon. If you look at, for instance, the ITF. Um, uh, there is a strong liaison relation around 5G uh, with 3GDP, um, and and we identify and uh, we I should say the ITF identifies a number of things where uh, the ITF specifications may play a role. Um, that's not on the on on the on the radio connectivity layer. Um, but there will be a lot of virtualization in 5G and um, uh, 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 all kinds of different models like network slicing, um, different types of authentications and so on and so forth, where the IETF um, has building blocks that can and, and probably will be applied. And that is, in fact, a good bridge to the next slide, because uh, one of the things, so next slide, um, one of the chapters in the in the rolling plan, plan talks about horizontals. Um, horizontals um, uh, really being things that are not really fitting in any of these 
uh, uh, vertical policy areas that are, are looked at in the other chapter, chapter three of the rolling plan, but that can be applied in multiple places and are useful across the, uh, uh, the infrastructure. And I think that if you look at, 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 at the way that the internet stack is built from a, from a more technical perspective and, and the infrastructure interoperability perspective, that is exactly the place where um, where these horizontal um, um, standards uh, take a place. The role of the um, uh, ITF, the role of W3C, the global, um, what I would almost say, informal standards body, the foreign consortia in the, in the EU speak. Um, my read of the um, um, uh, uh, rolling plan specifically for instance on 5G is uh, is look at at the global global space so look at the global players where relevant horizontal interoperable specs can be uh, created look at ITF look at um, uh, uh, 3GGP look at ITU um, look at IEEE for you know the specific buildings blo building blocks that are needed for the for the technology at hand that said um, standardization is a market um, I think Jonathan uh, uh, made that made that point and I guess that has to do with his, his game theory and economic history uh, made that uh, uh, point very um, very astutely and what we see currently in the market, I would, I would say, is, is, is a big shift. Uh, next slide. Um, and I would summarize that in sort of my personal observation as uh, specs or code. A lot of the underlying technology nowadays is uh, not written down any longer. Uh, it's not written down as a, as a specification that that will create interoperable, um, on which others can create interoperable code. But basically innovation is done as a piece of code. It's put on GitHub. This is the GitHub logo for those who, who don't know. And, 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 and taken from there. Uh, sometimes this is done uh, a little bit more formal. Um, uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, there is a, a spectrum of, of how, how, how um, uh, the, the trade-off between reference implementation and, and specification, uh, interoperable specifications are achieved. But you do see a tension there uh, because writing code is simply faster. And in a fast-moving uh, uh, world, um, you see uh, um, um, uh, groups forming around that. Um, Examples of that um, are, I think, specifically seen in, in, in places where, um, uh, uh, where virtualization is important, where people are, are, are working on APIs and making sure that there are standardized libraries on which people can build. Um, uh, SDN networks, uh, network virtualization uh, functions, uh, net sorry, network function virtualization is one of these aspects where, where you can see that happen. So there's a whole set of, um, of uh, 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 new ways to, to, to form work. The ITF has to deal with this issue as well because um, uh, the speed of innovation and the speed of the need for standards is increasing. How do you cope with that is a, is a, is a big question. Um, um, and and, and, and uh, having running code has always been an adagium in the ITF, so, so um, this is something that's been worked on. Um, one of the observations, however, is that if you want to, to drive the consensus, um, it doesn't really matter how you write down that consensus. Whether that consensus or, you know, final agreement uh, across a group of people who want to standardize um, is written down in a piece of uh, software or in a, in a, in a written specification. Um, uh, the thing is that this consensus needs to be uh, reached with 
with stakeholders. And, and those are the processes that, uh, that remain difficult and time consuming. Um, so I think that, again, the market will find a, a balance in that. Um, so those were the sort of three thoughts that I want to share. Uh, European uh, perspective, the rolling plan, the fact that horizontal building blocks um, uh, continue to be important, specifically at the lower ends of the stacks. Um, I think I agree with Jonathan, who says if you get to the, the higher end of the, spa uh, the stacks, um, sometimes you become um, uh, more specific and uh, the building blocks are less specific. Um, building blocks at the lower end of the stack uh, uh, help with the convergence, I would say. And then finally, uh, how you create those building blocks is, is, cur is, is under flux. Thanks a lot, uh, Olaf. Excellent. This is an excellent uh, setup from uh, Jonathan's global story via your uh, good take on the European perspective to to Chris, who uh, uh, is one of the officers of NIST. Um, Chris, can I ask you to come in and uh, share? I'm aware of the, 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 the time progressing a lot and I would love to keep a little bit of space for discussion as well. Um, I saw Sebastian already put in uh, uh, some questions in the chat. Let's have uh, the discussion in the chat at the same time. Uh, but Chris, uh, please progress and, and, and uh, share your contribution. I'm looking forward to hear from you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Martin. Uh, and I'll keep this as short as possible. Um, this presentation will be very different from the things that you've heard uh, preceding it uh, because the standards environment in the United States is quite different. And that is that uh, uh, industry leads the standards environment here uh, and uh, government supports those uh, industry efforts. So NIST is, is the organization I'm, uh, I'm at, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is a bureau in the U.S. Department of Commerce. We are not a standards body, and we do not do uh, standards development. Uh, we're a research organization, and we develop the technical contributions that others use to develop standards. And those others might be uh, national standard bo standards bodies like ANSI, uh, or uh, international uh, bodies like ISO, IEC, IEEE, and, and so on. So what I wanted to show you was the kind of technical work that we do to make contributions uh, for others to use in developing their standards. And, and the example I wanted to use was uh, the current effort underway for our smart city uh, framework. Um, this uh, framework effort is called Internet of Things Enabled Smart City Framework, or Yes City. And uh, you'll see at the bottom are the logos of our partners, uh, Fireware, which is a European nonprofit from South Korea, the Ministry of Science, ICT, and Future Planning. Uh, uh, also from the US, uh, ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, and the US Green Building Council, uh, and the Telecommunications Industry Association, but also from Europe, uh, ETSI, with whom you're all familiar, and from Italy, the uh, Italian Energy and Innovation Agency uh, as well. So these are broad international uh, partnerships. Uh, in, the, uh, in this case, uh, we're working uh, along a concept called pivotal points of, of interoperability. And the idea is that if you standardize everything, you can uh, freeze out inf innovation. If you standardize nothing, you get chaos, as we've already heard. And uh, we're working on this, on the principle of pivotal points of op interoperability. That is, where we're looking for uh, consensus uh, convergence uh, around uh, interfaces that, that can uh, provide interoperability and compositionality for cyber physical systems, in this case, or Internet of Things kinds of uh, applications. Uh, and this is just an artistic description of that same concept. And, and this uh, uh, diagram is just the innovation space, which with, in the absence of standards, <clears throat> you have the challenge that uh, there may be a very difficult uh, uh, way of achieving interoperability, where it is if you have a few pivotal points of interoperability reflecting these convergence lines, you uh, uh, provide the opportunity for convergence, consensus standards, 
minimizing what it takes to get interoperability and maximizing the potential for uh, diversity. So that's the concept we're uh, proceeding on. The, the uh, work is being done in three public working groups, shown in different colors here. Um, those who are developing smart city applications, providing their learning by doing. Uh, those who own architectures uh, that are out there already, like Fireware, or 1M2M, uh, uh, and so on, uh, on technical architectures, uh, and then on uh, communities that are actually deploying these concepts, um, uh, information from those deployments. And all of this is, feeds into a, uh, an analysis of, uh, amongst the existing uh, architectures and technologies, where are these points of convergence? And so the framework itself will have three components, a description of requirements, which is based on our cyber physical systems framework and its associated engineering concerns, uh, tools that uh, communities can use to, to describe their technical ready, readiness or to analyze their technical ready, readiness, uh, and then um, reproducible means for uh, assessing the benefits of smart city uh, deployments. And these are the things that, things that will go into the final uh, framework. That framework will come out as a, a set of spreadsheet tools uh, that enable uh, groups to, to uh, analyze uh, each of these, these things, the uh, engineering requirements, technology readiness, uh, and benefits uh, uh, for those deployments in a wide variety of application areas. This one just shows uh, the category of water and wastewater management, but other categories would be transportation, uh, energy, uh, uh, environmental uh, concerns, um, uh, public safety, uh, and so on. All right, so um, uh, this illustrates the process that we are trying to move from uh, complex smart city applications that are described in a set of written specifications and architectures. Uh, use the CPS framework to simplify that uh, process uh, in, in doing comparative analyses amongst existing architectures, identify potential points of, of interoperability, uh, use those to define the services that provide that, that interoperability. Uh, and bundle those services into zones of concerns that uh, would allow you to describe where the best standards opportunities are and, and where there's uh, technical convergence around uh, possible standards. So that gives you a sense of the methodology, but I wanted to highlight the factors that enabled uh, this collaboration, and there are several, as you see here. Um, the participants in, in this are all uh, uh, you know, contributing their own resources and participating on the basis of really lightweight uh, agreements, typically letters of intent. Uh, almost all of the work is done in virtual meetings and the documents are open on the web at all times to, to anybody who wants to see them so they can see what the current status is and what the final projects are. Um, the uh, focus is on voluntary and consensus-based standards. Um, but uh, we're uh, um, focused on existing technologies and deployments. So this, Jonathan, is not about future smart cities. This is about smart city deployments that are uh, out there uh, today uh, and uh, existing architectures like Fireware and, and so on. Uh, and as been said already, we're focused on uh, technology and business model neutral uh, concepts uh, as a way of promoting uh, innovation. All right, uh, so uh, let me end with that and turn it back to, to Martin. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, let's see whether... Thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. And uh, the, the last slide you showed uh, made me again aware that whereas uh, there's different uh, ways we deal with standardization across the world, there seems to be a bit of convergence as well in the, the, the lightweight agreements, in the open documents, the voluntary approach, uh, and really technology business model neutral. It's, it's, it's where we come together to the essence more and more of what standardizations are for, I think. Um, 
Now, moving towards Yanning Zhu, who uh, will explain what this specifically means for the 5G networks. Um, we had an interesting discussion which uh, demonstrated that actually if you look at 5G network research in the US you should uh, really look at uh, advanced mobile communications research. Uh, 5G terminology uh, is uh, maybe not exactly the same. But uh, Janning, maybe you can uh, enlighten us more on that and, and uh, share your perspective on, on standardization in the 5G domain. Hello, Janning is a little bit uh, low. Um, so yes, actually it was very interesting uh, um, discovery that actually I think the, the definition of 5G is slightly different in EU and the US side. Whereas in the US side it is mainly focused on increasing the I'm data. I'm sorry, data it's data. still a little bit low. Should um, talk can, you, can you hear better now? Next. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so on the US side, the basic the definition of 5G is more towards a higher data rate, so it's natural evolution of uh, 4G. But in EU side, our definition of 5G is more like a revolution, not just um, uh, data rates, but the verticals are different uh, requirements. So then we start with about uh, standardization. Actually, uh, in Olaf's talk, I have mentioned many times about uh, 5G uh, as a very good example. As he mentioned, this is a very important key, key, key enabler for digital single market. And there's a very strong uh, motivation to seek for global standardization. And uh, this is basically uh, embodied by this uh, uh, ITU uh, and uh, in 2015, they came up a uh, roadmap. Oh, sorry, it is still the previous slide. Yes, thank you. So it was made in 2015, this roadmap. Uh, wait. At the moment, we are here. That um, we have finished the study. Uh, uh, technique performance requirements, evaluation criteria, and uh, it features. So next month, actually I think it's next week, and the five, those requirements documents will be approved in the next ITU meeting in Munich. And another, at the same time, a workshop will be held at the same time to explain and the discussion those documents. Um, and uh, ITU will start to receive proposals from late uh, 2017 to middle 2019. Um, maybe here. And uh, the definition of the new radio interfaces uh, will be, that will be included in IMT 2020 will take place from uh, 2018 to 2020. So at the moment, there's a, under this timeline, there's a, uh, several uh, active parties that or, or standardization organizations are very actively working towards it. For example, 3GPP, IEEE, and IETF. Um, next slide, please. Oh, um, yes. And the timeline of CGP is the target towards IMT 2020 is to first uh, submit the initial technology uh, submission in 2019 and then. Uh, Submit detailed specification in 2020. And to meet such a target, they divided their uh, time uh, roadmap into two, three phases. First, 
5G study and then 5G phase 1 and 5G phase 2. They have finished the 5G study in the middle of this year. And at the moment, we are in the middle of 5G phase, phase 1. In phase 1, uh, there's a two technique uh, uh, aspects are considered. First is uh, 5G non-standalone, which means uh, the combination of LTE and the uh, new radio. It is expected to be finished end of this year. And another mode is uh, standalone that will be that is planned to be finished in the middle of next year. And considering the WRC 19 will decide we decide the international harmonized frequency band, especially in millimeter wave, and the 5G phase one will focus mostly on lower frequency from 0.4 gigahertz to 50 gigahertz. Uh, and uh, then the phase two, we, they will start to f uh, focus more on 50 gigahertz to 100 gigahertz. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Um, another important standardization organization is uh, IEEE. Uh, actually, it is under the umbrella of IEEE 5G initiative. Uh, this standardization working group was established last end of last year and sponsored by seven IEEE societies. Even though they are a little bit late uh, com compared to 3GP, but uh, they have some very important standards group, working groups. For example, uh, wireless LAN uh, working group that including IEEE uh, 801.11, sorry, it's a typo AD, that is the first gigabit per second uh, broadband uh, standard. And also, for example, 11P, which is a very important for uh, V2X communication and an important competitor to uh, cellular uh, V2X technology. And also, for example, one important use case, the tactile internet, the IEEE also have established a working group. So they can be very strong as well. And the last one I want to mention is uh, in Internet Engineer Task Force. Um, they have uh, several technical areas to cover. They are very essential to 5G. Uh, for example, as all I've mentioned many times, the virtualization that is essential for 5G. So their task will be to change IP protocols and routing and also improve uh, protocols for better efficiency and security. They will, as I understand, they are closely collaborate with CGP and uh, will be complementary to the work in CGP at the moment. So that's what I, I have for the moment. Jonathan, uh, Martin, you should be online. Oh, I should be more uh, hearable now, right? <laughs> yes. You hear me now? Yes. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Shining. For, yes, Shining, thank you for that. Uh, and uh, the point you made as well is that let's make sure that we talk about the same things when we look at collaboration. Uh, what we may uh, name one specific code name that every European understands may be uh, understood entirely different in different parts. So I think this is an important lesson to take forward as well. Also appreciate your, your sketch, sketching that it's really not one body who makes this happen, it's uh, across bodies. Uh, I would like to invite uh, the, the next speaker, Mr. Uh, Ray Walsh, who is member of the expert group on big data. He joined uh, Picasso recently. We're very happy to have him. Uh, Ray, can you take it away what uh, standardization means for big data? And please, uh, sorry for this, but I, I appreciate you if you if you can keep it as short and sharp as you can. Uh, I'm aware the time has flown. Yes, I'm aware that we're uh, we're running short on time. I uh, hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, 
So, yeah, good afternoon anyway, firstly, and thanks to Martin and Jonathan and all the Picasso team for facilitating this standards event. I'm, I'm delighted we have an opportunity to discuss some of my work with ICT standardization. I'm just going to introduce three slides, so I'll be as quick as possible. Um, specifically, going to talk about, and um, there's one that is in front of you there now, which is the uh, JTC1 uh, work uh, on big data, but I'll be also talking about the European Commission BDBA uh, uh, Public Private Partnership and the International Workshop on Big Data Standardization. And there's only there are three quite quick slides, but because the, the talk was so short, I put um, graphics on there rather than text just to try and convey some of the work um, more accurately as to what's going on, because there's quite a, a volume of activity in each of these. But firstly, the Big Data Reference Architecture, anyway, the BDRA. This is ISO, obviously, the International Standards Organization, um, JTC1, which is a joint technical committee, which is a, a, a joint initiative between ISO and IEC. Uh, working Group 9, then, is the, the subgroup within JTC1 who are looking at the big data, uh, big data standardization task. And, then, and uh, what their task is looking at is like basically the, the big, data, big data landscape and ecosystem and it's sort of de de depicted in, in the background here of this particular slide to, to give you some sort of an idea of the complexity in terms of the infrastructure, the analytics, the applications, interoperability issues, and to develop a, a standardized set of terms, uh, definitions, vocabulary, uh, which can be seen on the top left-hand side of the, the um, slide here. Um, uh, just depicted, I can't seem to get the, the pointer working here at the moment. Um, so at the top left hand side of the slide, and it depicts the standards document 20546. And Chris might be uh, aware of this. Wo, Wo Chang from NIST is heavily involved in these standards development, and also Nancy Grady from, from the US uh, national body as well. And they're creating a, 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 a basically a position where everybody's able to speak off the same uh, from the same context. So you have a standard way of looking at all, all of these uh, terms and initiatives. Um, so that's the so that's the, the starting point with a lot of ISO initiatives. Uh, the the next thing then is, is as can be seen there, there's a, a roadmap for big data. So that was the the, the terms and can they, terms and definitions of vocabulary are the two or five or six uh, document the roadmap for big data related standards uh, in general. So any any standard standards that already exist, which are uh, maybe ha are touching on on the the big data. Uh, fields and that could be from from databases or to to communications technologies etc they are covered and, and listed in the 205 or 7-5 uh, document um, use cases and their their associate drive technical requirements for the big data re re uh, reference architecture that's the technical specification so that's the as listed on the top left hand side there the 205 or 7-2 and and that document I submitted to JTC1 just recently because that's that's a technical specification. It's not, it won't become an international standard like like the, the big data reference architecture, but that technical specification was submitted to JTC1 for publication just in August um, uh, this this year, August 2017. Uh, also, obviously, there's a, there's a, a security uh, document related to the big data reference architecture, which is the 205.47-4, and that. That is in, in conjunction with, with other standards committees, uh, SC27, um, uh, Working Group 4 and Working Group 5. Uh, so some of the work that's done on that is, is a shared ownership uh, between WG9 and SC27. Then there's the reference architecture itself, which is in the bottom right-hand corner there, in the sort of grey box, uh, which is, is the component that, that make up the reference architecture. It, it, it's an international standard document. That's the 205 or 7-3, and we've just it got up as far as the committee draft stage, so we went through several revisions, um, working draft revisions, uh, five, and I think we prior to going to the committee draft stage, which we're at now, and that will be deliberated on in February at the uh, at the plenary meeting in, um, I think that meeting is in India, and you can see there the the various components that that are made up there, the application provider layer, the processing layer, multi layer functionality, etc., and and obviously this is something that's done. Uh, true ISO with international experts from from all over the world and and uh, representatives from the national bodies from from all of the member states. Um, so on next slide then the second area of standardisation, the one you can see on this side now is is just a quick overview of some of the work that the the European Union are doing through the Big Data Value Association uh, in terms of big data standardisation. Uh, the BDVA or the Big Data Value Association for those who haven't 
um, they come across this particular consortium before is that it's a public private partnership between the European Commission and pretty much big data industry partners. And as you can see in the top left hand side of this particular slide, the second there, the, sorry, the BVD has a number of task force and their responsibilities are as listed there, you're talking about big data policy, technology aspects, emerging applications, business models, and, and also then the skills requirements to support all of that industry. And all of these are impacted by and impact upon standardization. So there's, if you can see in, in, in terms of that, that particular uh, slide, there's a the top left hand corner, the, there's a two yellow, a vertical and a horizontal yellow slide uh, bar really, which is where standardization is cross cutting across each of those um, technology uh, forces, sorry, technology task forces. Um, and within that, the, the yellow box then is basically TF6, SG6, which is Task Force 6, the Technical Task Force, and the Subgroup 6, which is Standardization. And that's the, the group which I chair there for the BDVA. Um, and they're not, it's not just limited to uh, the tech, the looking at the big data technology related standardization issues, but it, there's a, there's a cross-cutting aspect to it. Um, we look at uh, reference architectures for, for, for different, not just the BDRA, the, the ISO big data reference architecture model, but also other reference architectures and models for cloud and IoT and, and, and 5G, um, which we saw mentioned earlier. And they're developing, a, with a view to developing a reference model, so the BDDA reference model, which would allow us to map uh, all of these other um, architectures and models to each other and back to um, a, a, probably ultimately the ISO WG9 uh, reference model. Okay, and then the final slide there, we'll just skip across to that, um, is on, uh, it's, it's just to highlight some issues that relate to collaboration uh, because really all, all of these areas, whether you're talking about IoT or, or big data, uh, smart cities, etc., it's all really part of the same ICT uh, ecosystem. You cannot separate the, the the networks apart. They're they're cross meshed every which way. And what I what I do as part of my work on, on standardization is I, I run the international workshop on big data standards, uh, which is a, a collaboration between some of the ISO work I do, some of the BDVA work I do as well. And and this international workshop, which is in its 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 sixth uh, uh, innings at this stage, its sixth edition. And it's been hosted in Europe, um, and twice in Dublin. It's been in the U.S. in in in, uh, in Fairfax. It's been in, in Asia and China. Um, and we bring together international experts from IEEE Standards Association, ISO, ETSI, SENSENLEC, W3C, ITUT, various national standards bodies. The European Commission themselves are are, are at these uh, workshops. Um, the BDVA are represented not just by myself but by other colleagues from from di different task forces within BDVA. AIOTI, so the, the Alliance for the IoT Innovation Working Group 3, which is associated with standardization as well, Open Geospatial Consortium, OPC Foundation. There's lots of them. You can you can get it off these slides, like you can see the, there's a bit of an agenda there, and there's mugshots of some of some of the, the great and the good from standards all over the world are, are represented at these workshops. Um and, and this is to bring viewpoints basically and provide foresights into ICT developments in right across the, the landscape, the ICT landscape, not just big data, even though it's a big data workshop, the big data centric workshop, but also we'd have cloud experts, as I said, IoT experts, 5G, and analytics uh, experts as well there, giving their talks and, and sitting on panels and trying to, in, from a collaborative point of view, to bring all of these, these new and emerging technologies and, and standards development uh, initiatives together into the one space and try and feed off them and progress them to to really, to, as far as I'm concerned, to solve two problems or, or two issues, like there's, there's the main two tenets of which standards, standards are developed for me are to provide interoperability, which is what we want to do right across, not just the big data sphere, but in IoT, 5G as well, that all of these systems work together. And then there's international trade, like from purely from a business perspective, uh, this, this is common sense. And uh, it, that's why I'm quite happy and I'm delighted that we got the opportunity to talk on this um, subject, and even though very, very briefly, um, in relation to what EU, EU and US can do uh, by bringing the, the work of some of these groups together. Like, you know, so you can mention, I can see mentioned even on this slide here with the logos in the center, about the bottom there with the ISO, BDVA, and my own National Standards Authority of Ireland, the NSDI. And if you bring other groups into the, into the mix then to discuss standardization and where things are, are, 
are heading in terms of the next generation standardization, like which will be AI and blockchain, etc. Um, I think then we can raise all ships and, and contribute to um, a faster evolving standards landscape. So that's it. I, as short and sweet as I could be, Mark. Oh, thanks, uh, Ray. And uh, it's 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 been very uh, clear, very very clear story, very clear demonstration of how important, but also how much it is central to uh, uh, global debates. Not only for the standards aspect uh, in terms of technical ways, but also the the trade aspects, as as you mentioned uh, rightly. Uh, ICT touches everything, and in particular the economy as well. And I can see uh, this is as important as a technical expert, even if you think in terms of standards. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, Christian, uh, may I ask you, last but not least, in this li tiny little thing that's called IoT, uh, as I said, uh, not IoT, as in little thingies, but also in particular in cyber-physical systems. Uh, what's happening uh, in your field? How 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 do we work together across the Atlantic in this field? Hey, can you hear me? Okay, uh, so my name is Christian Sontag. I'm the manager of the IoT CPS CPS expert group. I'll just briefly talk about some of the lessons regarding standardization that I've, or that we've learned while we were preparing our opportunity report, um, which is one of the major results of the Picasso project that you can download on our website. So just a brief introduction to what we're looking at. So the areas of IoT and CPS are obviously huge. So we have focused ourselves on a specific scenario of IoT and CPS, which we call IoT enabled CPS. Um, and the idea is here, we're not looking at the middleware, uh, sensing, connectivity. Um, we are looking at how we can close the loop between sensing and actuation. So how can we generate benefits from the huge amount of data that can be collected? And in this sense, uh, we see IoT as an enabling technology for future cyber physical mm -hmm. systems. If you're more interested more in the cyber physical systems or systems, which we also call this, then you can go to our website of a previous project, CPSOS, which is shown here. Um, so what we found is, during our work, that interoperability is one of the key challenges, which has a standardization aspect um, in IoT CPS in the US. Technology, technologically, some of the Challenges that we've identified are semantic interoperability, semantic models, plug and play integration, uh, IoT and CPS architectures, cross domain infrastructures, platforms, test beds, pilots, but also heterogeneous modeling, open formalisms for uh, modeling and simulator interoperability. Um, and also the, in the application sector that we've been looking at, which are production energy, transportation, and smart cities, all of these interoperability challenges are crucial. So in smart production, which is the domain that we're looking usually at here in Dortmund, um, you have you want to generate interoperability of thousands of cyber physical uh, of cyber and physical components to enable global real-time access and the integration of the whole value chain. In smart energy there's a need for harmonization of grids and value chains. In smart transportation transportation there are obviously lots of examples. And smart cities is another area that we've been looking at um, where interoperability is used is needed to enable smart functionalities, which also Chris was been talking has been talking about before. Um, so some of the efforts and challenges that we've identified. Um, so on the one hand, of course, for the Internet of Things, there is a vast number of standardization efforts, and if you've read the report that Martin sent around, there's a very good list. Um, summary of um, some of the lesson efforts regarding, for IoT, regarding IoT protocols and interoperability, which is at this link, but you can also check this in the report. In the area that we are mostly looking at, which is sort of the industrial internet of things and cyber physical systems, um, some of the efforts and reference architectures are in the EU, IoT of course is working on this, and the EI, um, IERC. In Germany, Industry 4.0 is obviously a huge topic 
where people are also working on the development of reference architectures for the next um, for future in this industry. Excel, the Excel joint undertaking, Artemis Industry Association, Fireware, and lots of others, which I don't have space to show here. In the US, uh, NIST is of course very involved. You've seen the talk by Chris Greer. Uh, and he also gave a very nice talk about the NIST CPS framework, where he explained that, uh, that this can also be used to represent the merging of IoT and CPS. So if you're interested in this talk, the slides are available on our website. Um, on the website of our Minneapolis Symposium. Then other initiatives are the Industrial Internet Consortium, which is international, but its headquarters are in the US, I think. All Seen Alliance, Open Connectivity Foundation, FERC, and others. Um, the main challenge that we've identified is harmonization of interoperability standards between the US and the EU. Because these IoT-enabled systems are generally international infrastructures, and because standards define future markets, so standardization and especially harmonization of standards is a very important activity. And one of the co collaboration opportunities that we've identified are that you want to initiate and promote joint experiments and infrastructure sharing using, again, lightweight measures, nothing too heavy. So this includes joint work on international standards uh, and interoperability. And we've also found in discussions and interviews that People see this as easier than cooperation on topics between companies on topics of high commercial importance. So we believe that there might be good opportunities here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian. Now, uh, very much aware of uh, time have, having gone uh, faster than we expected. Uh, uh, I would uh, first urge you to uh, feel free to send uh, any further remarks on the report to the email address mentioned in the report. Uh, uh, we'll be very, ha very happy to pick it up. Uh, there was uh, in the chat a good uh, input from uh, Sebastian on ethics. Uh, that is indeed an issue that is central. Uh, how on earth, that's maybe a good expression, do we go about with an ethical approach in a world where values are not entirely the same uh, everywhere or not expressed in the same way? Uh, there's we're all people and we all uh, care about human dignity and we have human value, uh, human, human rights as a kind of global value. Uh, how can we operate in a single global environment uh, from different cultures and with different ethics? I think this is one of the underlying issues that uh, affects both standardization, uh, security, and also uh, uh, very much the ethics of uh, how we deal with things. Privacy, obviously, as well. Um, the other aspects, very much appreciate the, the input on, on uh, from all speakers, uh, really excellent. Uh, it helps to further sharpen uh, our thinking and our awareness. Uh, you may find that uh, according to the document we, we had, uh, uh, we, we're, we're, I think, on track. And uh, our aim is to finalize it and sharpen it further after this. So unless there are very urgent questions right now, I think uh, it may be uh, best to uh, hear with uh, uh, close the session. Uh, uh, know that you can always send uh, questions to uh, martin at gnksconsult.com as indicated in the document. The document is available at uh, www.picasso-project.eu where you found it, and we'll also do the slides and the recording of the session there. Uh, our intent is to update the report uh, based on this session shortly, and there will be a short report on this uh, session as well. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, APRA, for your excellent hosting, and a special thanks to the speakers for their introductions. Uh, we couldn't have done it without you. Wishing you a great evening. And morning, if you're in the States, 
uh, and uh, looking forward to be in touch with you. Thanks, so thank thanks, you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.